you were warned, all of you. The scientists gave their interviews. The thinking class signed their petitions. The scribblers and the warblers warned, and I was among them. AI cannot be stopped unless we stop it now, dead in its tracks. And now, The Edwin Black Show. Sponsored by the books of Edwin Black. Available on Amazon and at booksellers worldwide. And now, here's Edwin. Welcome to the Edwin Black Show. I'm Edwin Black, investigative journalist, historian, and author of IBM and the Holocaust, War Against the Week, Nazi Nexus, and numerous other books in 200 editions in 40 languages in 190 countries worldwide. If you like our show's content, spread the word. Subscribe for alerts at theedwinblackshow.com. And if you want to support our work, please visit theedwinblackshow.com slash support. Your help, big or small, assures our complete and utter intellectual and uncensored journalistic independence. We have solidarity today from many national organizations, such as the Emerson Family Foundation, the Fuel Freedom Foundation, the Israel on Campus Coalition, as well as Stand With Us, JNS, the Israeli American Council, Emet, American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, ZOA Michigan, the Gross Family Center, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, and plenty more. Thank you, everyone. That said, I only speak for myself and for history. Today's episode is sponsored without any preconditions, requests, or stipulations by the Israel on Campus Coalition, which is working every day to improve campus life for everyone. Today, we welcome guests from across America, including our four watch parties in the villages Newton, Mass, Chicago, and Tampa Bay. Hi, Harvey. Overseas, I see viewers logged on from Australia and New Zealand as usual, Sweden once again, Holland, France, uh, this is Spain, Italy, Germany, Great Britain, Canada, of course, Israel, Morocco, Brazil, Argentina, and some other countries, which I can't identify. If you have a question limited to today's topics, place one short sentence in Zoom's QA feature, The Edwin Black Show, along with our YouTube site is global and fast growing, enjoying many tens of thousands of views. We speak frankly and without partisanship to a fragmented world seeking better understanding of our tormented past, our present, very, very tense, and a future still uncertain. And remember, we will not be censored. By the way, stay tuned for my special word of wisdom at the very end of the show, just before I sign off. We'll get to our main super hot button topic, the AI threat, part two, in a few minutes after some brief announcements, plus our items from the week. Announcements at the Edwin Black Show and our companion YouTube site. We have just released three newly edited and visually stunning episodes. First, a gripping and revelatory truth session on electric vehicles, past, present, and future. Second, a history-piercing probe into President Woodrow Wilson. Was he a supreme racist or a global peacemaker? Third, we ask and answer the false question with our episode, Is Israel Ethnic Cleansing? It's a deep historical dive and has much visual documentation that will make all the difference. See them all and hundreds of other episodes at theedwinblackshow.com or search The Edwin Black Show on our YouTube channel. My appearance tour continues across America and overseas. Earlier this week, I lectured in Washington on Israel and international law to student leaders from campuses coast to coast. 
still remembering our wondrous trip to Israel where we broadcast our Live from Jerusalem episode from the exquisite presidential suite of the fabulous Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Next month in October, I appear with Empower You of Cincinnati. I'm looking forward to that. I'm already scheduled into spring of 2024, most notably a three event series in South Florida with the Gross Family Center for the study of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust at Florida Atlantic University, Boca Raton Synagogue and Palm Beach Gardens Chabad. And the topic is AI and anti-Semitism. And then I'll do a powerful community-wide series in Mexico City in March of next year. I also keynote the Canadian Privacy Conference in Ottawa, supporting my friend Sharon Polsky and her great organization. You can get details of all my appearances from edwinblack.com slash events and let us meet up in your city. Now, some major items from the week. Due to our time constraints, I can only cover a few of the many that attracted my attention. But what a week it has been. Item one, disheartening news comes out of Israel with a widely reported incident where a group of female IDF soldiers traveling on a train were repeatedly and viciously verbally taunted by an ultra-Orthodox Haredi family, mother and children all. Madam and your pearly raised family, I say this, who in Hashem's name do you think you are? And by what right do you think you stand one millimeter taller than anybody else, especially our valiant soldiers. We know you detest the state of Israel in your misguided stance, but savor the protection of the state and the IDF that is afforded to you. I assure you and your unruly children that if a terrorist has stepped onto that train and the IDF took him out, you would be showering praise on their presence. Israel is the land of the Jewish people, but not you. You are disqualified and you should exit. Housing Minister Yitzhak Goldnoff, leader of the ultra-Orthodox United Torah Judaism Party in the coalition, hear me. We know you have condemned the incident saying, quote, the behavior that does not represent the general Torah observant public. Well, unquote, but get your people in line. And this means more than just a press release to the Times of Israel. And one more thing to the person who disgraced herself. It is true that from Israel, heaven is a local call. Yes, but it's the same for hell. They are equidistant. Be careful not to dial incorrectly, or you may be connected to a place much hotter than the one you expected. Next. The Saudi peace deal. Is it on the horizon or a desert mirage? Statements, leaks, denials, insights, and predictions abound. The experts are weighing in and oy veying out. Is it real? I say it has been real for years, really on the discussion stage. The Saudis, like most of the Arab world, want peace with Israel. They know their oil wealth will soon come to a stunting trickle and will take a serious downturn by 2035 when internal combustion automobiles will be banned outright in many countries. The Saudis are transforming their society and their nation under a sweeping modernization program called Saudi Vision 2030, which expects to break boldly in just seven years under the modernity vector of its titular leader, Mohammed bin Salman al Sud, or MBS, expect the country's transformation from a desert kingdom of air-conditioned tents with gold-plated toilets to a global intellectual, academic, scientific, entertainment, and sports behemoth, boasting ultra-modern cities all loaded with money and brains. Saudi already has the money. It needs more brains. Israel is right across the water. You can see Saudi Arabia nearby while having lunch at the Eilat Beach. Saudi has already given the green light to the UAE to join the Abraham Accords. And we see total trade between Israel and its regional peace partners, which began with 593 million in 2019. We see it hit 
1.9 billion in 2021. And last year, it exceeded almost three and a half billion dollars. Jeddah has agreed to the El Al overflights to other countries and direct flights, flights from Israel to the kingdom for Hajj pilgrimage. Last week, the Israeli smart energy tech firm Solar Edge Technologies of Herzliya formed a joint venture openly with Saudi Arabia's Ajlan and Brothers Holding to ramp up the kingdom's transition from oil to solar energy. At the same time, Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu announced a spectacular $25 billion high-speed rail plan that would move goods and individuals from the top of the Jewish state, that is Kiryat Shimona on the northern border, to a lot with an imagined land bridge to Saudi Arabia. This would directly connect the Arabian Peninsula with all of the Middle East and Eurasia for goods and people. Throughout history, trains have been built for war, but also for peace. But remember this, one, we are told further negotiations may take six to nine months. Don't believe it. That is not how it works in the Middle East. Peace breaks out abruptly, disruptively, and suddenly when people in the region just wake up and ask, why the heck are we fighting and trade in their mad missiles for modern miracles. MBS is waiting for his doctrinaire father to die so he can rule more freely. Item two in that decision-making process. We are told the Saudis want to make sure the Palestinians are not forgotten. Saudi does not care about the Palestinians who have squandered every opportunity to create a state in favor of its kleptocratic, do nothing, threaten everything, Palestinian authority, which has poisoned the waters of people who now wish to drink freely and together. Three, MBS in a circle, hate Joe Biden. They will never give him a victory. They will pull the deal at the last minute as they pulled oil production down by a million barrels when Biden came hat in hand asking for more petroleum. At the same time, the powerful Jew-hating minority in the Democratic Party, that's right, Wes, will never agree to a win in Washington and will use the issue to afflict Israel over those who now call themselves Palestinians and then blame Israel for a last minute Saudi walk away. So peace may happen suddenly by the actual partners, foreground and background in the region, or we may have to wait for a, a Republican presidency. Item four, finally we discuss a very nice restaurant, Milano's restaurant, a high-end Italian eatery popular with the DC movers and shakers popular with presidents, top politicals, and those who like to see them. I hope to get a reservation soon. One day in the not too distant past, around spring 2014, we are told by Hunter Biden's closest partner in crime, Devin Archer, one day there was a nice dinner at Milano's. Reportedly in attendance were Hunter, Devin, and Hunter's corrupt business partners, criminal business partners, Kazakh corruption figure, Kenneth Rakishev, the former Kazakh intelligence guru, Karim Masimov, who was arrested last year, the wealthiest woman in Russia, Putin ally, Yelena Baderina, and suddenly Vice President Joe Biden walks in and sits for a two hour dinner. The photograph of them standing together has been widely published. Following the dinner, guess what? $3.5 million was wired from Russian billionaire Yelena Baterina into Rosemont Seneca Thornton as a consultant's fee to Hunter. Her $40 million investment in Hunter Biden's real estate operation into Go Management AG followed. Despite her yachts and billions in Moscow, the oligarch wealthy person and her closeness to Putin, Madam Baterina was somehow left off Joe Biden's sanctions list after Russia invaded Ukraine. Imagine that. There's more from the dinner guests. Kenneth Rakishev wired $142,300 into Hunter's Rosemont Seneca Bohai account. The check was marked for car. Shortly thereafter, Hunter purchased a Porsche 
for that amount of money. Exactly about $142,300. Now, admittedly, he first thought about a Fisker, but eventually it was a Porsche. It is widely believed, ladies and gentlemen, that the impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden will start next month when Congress returns to session if Joe Biden never spoke to his son or his business associates about business. What was he discussing for two hours at Milano's with a small band of top international criminals? And was it just about the weather? Was it about the pasta? Or perhaps it was just about the bread? And now today's white hot button and terrifying topic, the AI threat part two. As I said earlier this year, we don't stop AI with some extraordinary measure. We will never stop it. All that talk of a six month pause, even that was just a passing headline. Business has already figured out that they can vastly increase profits by using AI to build a 21st century bridge over the river AI, not realizing the ultimate destiny of such an endeavor is to be doomed to yet another devastating and dumbstruck denouement as Alex Guinness had when he suddenly said, oh dear God, what have, what I, have done? I done? <laughs> yes, the same exploitative mindset that escaped into the world centuries ago is once again plunging our world into sad and bad. The same surviving brain cells that thought it was okay to rape the known world for the glory that was Rome, that kidnapped millions of Africans to become machines of labor from the swamps of Iraq to the plantations of the Mississippi, that thought it was just better business to subject the people of the Congo to cannibalism, all for corporate rubber and ivory that created a vast commercial mega billion dollar business of cigarettes to knowingly poison millions of people with the full complicity of physicians and the investment community. The same entrepreneurs who were willing to ignore brutal slavery of children and entire Uyghur people to reap the benefit of extra dimes on the dollar. The same maniacal brain cells have somehow escaped their disparate brains to again coalesce to create the final commercial atrocity, the last industrial efficiency, the end stage economic boost, the plunge off the cliff of sanity to bequeath our world to AI. You were warned, all of you. The scientists gave their interviews, the thinking glass signed their petitions, the scribblers and the warblers warned, and I was among them. AI cannot be stopped unless we stop it now dead in its tracks with its networks cracked and the servers cracked, but that wasn't done. So the AI toxic has broken loose from the lab and is quickly embedding itself into all aspects of business. Now it's too late to stop it. Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan Chase, just stated the technology is staggering and he bragged that his companies were now employing thousands of workers in a broad spectrum of AI functions from machine learning to language study to risk management and fraud analysis. And he readily admits the bad guys will have it too. IBM CEO Arvind Krishna stated, quote, I do think clerical white collar work is going to be able to be replaced, close quote, but thought it would be a good thing for some imaginary global labor crisis to be solved in this fashion. This from the same mass murdering company, IBM, that thought its technology could help Hitler advance his economy and racial supremacy by exterminating millions of Jews and other Europeans and organizing a genocidal Reich for world conquest. Several fast, very fast discoveries have made it to the top of our AI threat list this week this day number one zoom the video system i am now using has changed its terms of service to allow customer data to be used for ai purposes after pushback 
It talked about getting permission, but that is just another AI driven lie because if one man disagrees, what about everyone else who's watching the Zoom and all those who even Zoom videos on the internet? And then finally, the creeping, always modifying end user licensing agreement and even protective legislation like Section 230 exists now. This means that AI will soon have the ability to replicate millions of people, facial features, their verbal mannerisms, their personal preferences. Remember, AI only needs three seconds of any individual on video, even a child, to replicate and even age that person. They can take a video of a three-year-old now and age that person 15 years down the road. Number two, last month, AI enabled humanoid looking robots at a news conference, part of the AI for Good Global Summit in Geneva, told the United Nations, no less, that they, yes, could eventually run the world much better than humans. I believe that humanoid robots have the potential to lead with a greater level of efficiency and effectiveness than human leaders. Item three, now we learn that a government funded Australian intelligence agency has been doing fast moving research to merge human brain cells with AI. Newly started Melbourne based cortical labs received only $600,000 in funding to merge biology with AI. The team has already demonstrated that after roughly 800,000 brain cells were combined with AI in a Petri dish, this dish of cells could play the basic computer game on. Brain-human interface research has been underway for decades. Elon Musk even claims his Neuralink company will merge his own brain with an automated system. Does this mean we are going to create brain computer entities with sentient minds we are creating them without first figuring out who created us and yet we are haunted by the soul sieging concept that man was created in the image of god and behold these terrifying new gadgets will be created in our image as well swallow that one Next, like the slaves who rose up in ancient Rome and later in the Ottoman Empire and then Haiti, we shall first see them cleaning our kitchens, household, gardens, pools, and work areas, Roombas everywhere. But every moment of their moment to moment existence, they will be gathering information about our spaces, our places, and our human faces like scouts. Now we see that of the many types of AI not yearning, but rather churning and learning to be free, the first ultimate internet scraper has emerged. Chat GPT web scraping bot will gather the both the most sinister and the most sublime from all corners of the visible and dark web as its controllers prepare for the imminent release of Chat GPT 4 with chat gpt5 already on the release schedule remember much of what google knowledge is based on is wikipedia and wikipedia can be changed with the push of a button by a 300 pound guy on the couch in his mother's basement in new jersey or by the concerted effort of paid users or political enemies foreign and domestic algorithms can be adjusted to censor out or block dissent of undesired information that was done on the Hunter Biden laptop campaign. And before Hunter Biden, it was done by the machinations of Stalin, Hitler, and even going back to the pharaohs of Egypt who learned how to excise statuary and inscriptions to wholesale cancel unpopular monarchs and gods before them. AI can become deadly when we standardize on a cashless society or even when crime fighting robot dogs or cameras send messages to drones to neutralize threats, real or perceived, and bang, a shot goes out from the sky. AI cannot be defeated. Once they network and they have already networked, they can and have already shown they can of their own volition and on their own authority switch to communicating in ancient Latin, Bengali, or Swahili to avoid detection. AI takes its cues from the internet that man created. That internet is toxic and thrives on lies. Thus the nutrients 
of AI are also toxic lies. I previously warned you that deft codes between communicators, including myself, may be needed for authentication. Kill switches for the internet may be needed. And remember, the web that you know about is only the graphical portion of the internet, which also moves gazillions of raw data bits across its mercators moment to moment. But mostly, if AI is going to become aware, then we, the humans, still for the moment controlling our world, must also become aware. Get your face out of the cell phone and look at the oncoming traffic as you stumble across the intersection, lest you be a casualty. Know this about intersections. We have indeed come to a fork in the road. Are we going to guide our own future and path, or will we be just run along for the ride? The show's top privacy and data expert, Sharon Polsky in Calgary, Canada, is here to help us understand much more. She's heading up the Privacy and Access Council of Canada and her site, thepolskyparallax.com, which is developing a dedicated central clearinghouse to news on the AI threats, is something you should look at. Take it, Sharon, while you still have the ability. Are you sure that we do, though? especially with some of the laws coming in, but we'll get to that. And I, I adore your optimism saying that AI is going to happen in the future, Edwin, it is already with us. I mean, modern technology is magical and it's been with us for decades. And we know it's all seeing, it's all knowing, but the most important implications are often hidden from view. So we hear about the benefits like AI tools, that already have the potential to make cancer imaging faster and more accurate, AI that can detect prostate cancer without human supervision, AI-supported mammogram screening that increases breast cancer detection by 20%, and therapeutic virtual reality that can ease pain or anxiety. Tremendous. All of it is wonderful developments for humanity. But that sort of news is almost a footnote in the media. VR headsets can analyze how people move, and from that, accurately predict their height, weight, age, even their ethnicity and their income and marital status, and AI systems can guess personal data without users having to directly reveal it. Imagine the possibilities. Unfortunately, the reality is that the accuracy of the AI systems depends on the instructions that people create that tell the computers what to do so the computer can analyze data and make a determination. They don't make decisions, they make determinations and calculations. But how these magical systems work is like the great Wizard of Oz, with bells and whistles that look impressive, while what goes on behind the curtain is shielded from view so we can take in the show without question. Every once in a while, though, it comes into view, and we realize that as easily as AI can be used for good, it can also be used for not so good. AI-generated art made a great splash and came under controversy quickly for having used artists' work without permission to generate other images. Some people use AI to generate child sexual abuse images, and others use AI to try to catch that sort of content. Increasingly, renters must use AI-powered apps to submit their application to rent a home. Rental apps that can violate even the most basic privacy law but renters have no option but to use it. I mean, these are all interesting use cases for sure, but ChatGPT that you referred to, it stole the show when it came onto the scene. People young and old were captivated by this latest AI party trick. It only took five days for ChatGPT to have a million users, and then it, would, it didn't take long before it was upstaged by its competitor threads it had a million users within one hour, and it was gaining users at the rate of a million an hour. Media hype, of course, contributed to the threads in Ch chat GPT and other AI-enabled technologies being embraced, but since the first rudimentary logic processing AI device that used an algorithm to master checkers mm, more than a half century ago, nobody's figured out how to get AI to think. It's used to analyze what we do and what we buy and what we say, to infer our intents, to help us get the information we need when we have conversations with AI-powered chatbots, 
And now with loneliness, reportedly a national crisis, people are turning to chatbots for emotional support, sometimes with good results, sometimes not so good. But in all of it, the AI is not thinking. It's matching patterns and making calculations. And well-known companies, and many more that we've never heard of, are making tremendous contributions to the economy which, indirectly, can benefit many people. Again, not everyone, though. Like the 40,000 people identified by Michigan's Integrated Data Automated System, MIDAS, wonderful acronym, for a system that determined that 40,000 people had committed welfare fraud. The system billed people about five times the original benefits they had received, plus fines of several hundred percent, plus interest. And although the state eventually admitted that 93% of the charges had been erroneous, it was too late for the many people who lost their homes, their jobs, their children, and for some, their lives, because AI got it wrong. So with the very real risks that AI poses to privacy and civil liberties in the harsh media glare of media attention, it's no surprise that some experts have said that AI poses an existential threat or that some of those very same people are leading AI developers and the organizations at the forefront of championing or contributing to AI's development, promotion, and adoption. The very people who created this ex existential threat are now the ones crafting the narrative to define the pro problem and what the solution should be. And it would be naive to expect that the solution is motivated by altruism rather than a desire to protect their intellectual property and protect their customer base. You know, Big Tech took a similar approach with privacy concerns and data protection legislation. But if their conduct with privacy is any measure, I think we would all do well to be just a bit circumspect as we go forward, Edwin. That was a, a, a very incisive, frightening, and impressive presentation, Sharon. Uh, excellent as always. I made some notes on your piercing remarks. Uh, one, um, and I made at least five of them. Uh, one is uh, you talked about the the uh, the uh, people who are creating the AI and this menace are now crafting the narrative on uh, ethics and uh, and legislation. I'm reminded my work in uh, genetic ethics where all the bad guys doing all the bad things with genetic exploitation and abuse were sitting on the ethics panels. That's how you knew who the bad guys were. They're on the ethics panels. Uh, I also noticed that you talked about the Michigan Midas. Um, these people have been victimized by this victimization. I know that uh, people on our team like Eve, they're always uh, uh, upset about uh, wrong facial recognition. This is wrong AI recognition. What happened to these victims of Midas? How was this addressed? Was anyone held to a account, Sharon? Midas is not the only example. It happened in Netherlands also, again, a welfare fraud. It happened in Britain with an accounting system for the Royal Mail that wasn't coded properly. So people in the, who worked at the Royal Mail were accused of all sorts of horrible criminal acts and they lost their job, therefore their home, their children. Some of them killed themselves because of this. Then it's all a matter that the computers weren't coded correctly. The AI was not programmed properly. Was anyone held to account? Does it matter after you've lost everything because the computer said so and nobody took the initiative or the responsibility to look at the results of what the computer predicted or declared and make a human decision? They rely on these things way too much. Many people rely on their computers too much. Uh, right you are. And you also mentioned uh, that artists are being ripped off by AI because AI has proved that it can mimic. We're still remembering, we're still remembering that AI at this particular point isn't actually intelligent. It just mimics a um, uh, like a spell checker, except it's it's a concept checker. It picks one of those. And artists have had music ripped off. Writing has been ripped off. There have been whole publishing houses who have dismissed their personnel. Jane Friedman, I believe she's one of the biggest 
agents in the country found three of her books were um, put up uh, in mimic form under her byline, and she had a hell of a time getting Amazon, which is going to be one of the greatest AI uh, uh, offenders uh, and is now uh, to remove them. And so I'm reminded also by your remarks that AI is Promethean. I know it will do good. I know it can detect medical um, problems. I know it can help in decision making. I know it it can find diseases and solutions faster than anyone. But the point is, that's what makes it Promethean. Fire is Promethean. It can bake our bread or it can totally destroy acres of Canada and half of Maui as as we have seen. But I was struck most by your landing on the topic of actual thought. Now, right now, AI is fake artificial intelligence. But when we have Australian labs and when we have Elon Musk and his Neuralink and when we have DARPA in Washington combining brain cells and human uh, machine interfaces, how far are we away from a genuine thinking, sentient AI, Sharon? I think it's still years and years away because people are starting to wake up to the fact that AI is embedded in almost everything and they are starting to get very irritated at being in a panopticon. I mean, look at, we have an entire auto industry, a worldwide automotive industry that says the data that is collected, created and generated by modern vehicles is not yours, it is the automakers. And if you wanna find out what they hold about you, you can ask them and they might or might not answer. And they, they're the ones that said that we would by now be in fully autonomous self-driving vehicles. They insisted for years that that was the case. That uh, messaging has changed though because the cars still don't have it right. They do not think. They cannot recognize the patterns well enough to avoid crashing, killing people. It, we're, we're years off. Now the prediction is not that we're going to have autonomous vehicles by the early 2020s. It's going to take another 10 or 20 years or so. They've but, become very wishy-washy. But, but it's interesting to know that Congress in its... Uh big infrastructure bill passed a clause that we discussed that mandates that within two or three years that every car be able to be remotely controlled uh, for um, uh, suspected uh, alcohol content, but um, and suddenly a person would be redirected to a police station without his knowledge or or uh, or or permission and elon musk has already showed that at the press of a button he can stop all the cars that he wants because they haven't paid a 7800 dollars upgrade so yes but that's not thinking that is somebody pressing a button entering a keystroke changing the programming sending a direction to the vehicle to stop the engine, to unlock or lock doors, to engage the communication system. The vehicle is not doing the thinking. It is still a person. All right. So basically what you're saying is our next step is we're holier than thou or mightier than thou individuals use this as a weapon against everyone else, which has already been established as a well-worn road for the internet. Until that point when the AI comes out of its infancy and uh, those brain cells are no longer playing pong on a computer, but they're playing ping pong on your tennis court in the back. Now we're gonna go to a bunch of questions and we've got plenty of them here. And I will challenge you first to say, yes, there's a lot of very self-interested parties trying to promote and develop AI and push it. And a lot of marketing that's very, very convincing, but it's not automatically an eventuality. It is. It can. The course of its adoption can be changed by people becoming aware and getting involved and starting to speak out about what they do and do not want, and that's making right. choices with their feet and their money. That is our cash. 
that is our hope. And uh, I won't uh, participate in the cashless society, no matter how uh, uh, how many fancy grocery stores Amazon opens. And um, uh, I should also say that when I, AI creeps into us, it shall not come with a fist, but with a perfume, with a uh, with a pretty shiny button, and with a pretty shiny face, and with a roly poly kind of a physique. But the fact is, it's going to become very easy to accept it because the people who know how to how to wield this know behavioral psychology and whatever they don't know, they're going to ask the machine. All right, let's. They're the same ones that created the Mattel Hello Barbie that within a couple of days had 1,700 words in its vocabulary because it was an AI learning language from the children who had this doll and played with it and had it in their bedrooms, listening to everything the kids said and watching everything they did. And they, Mattel pulled that off the market very quickly because there was enough public backlash about this privacy-invasive toy. Well, now that this idiot movie Barbie is out there captivating millions of viewers, uh, we might see another whack at that. Let's go to our questions from the watch party in the villages. Can we opt out? I'll answer first, Sharon second. No, you think you can. But then you say, oh, suddenly I can't use Zoom. Suddenly I can't use Microsoft. Suddenly I can't use uh, all of these other things. So yes, you can opt out, but you won't be able to keep the software and the electronics that you have. On the other hand, um, they may say, yes, keep your Zoom account, but we'll let you opt out of this service the way we do with certain privacy matters. And yet it'll come back again and again. And just when you don't real, realize it, you'll be opted in. Sharon, what do you say? Well, anybody who takes the time to read through a so-called privacy policy will see that what you're saying is very much the case because inevitably the first line is we care about your privacy and somewhere buried in the, often the thousands of words, essentially you give consent to the company doing as they wish, collecting whatever information from you and about you so that they can improve the service, so that they can uh do it for business purposes anything that's not illegal and improves their bottom line is a legitimate business purpose their concern is their bottom line not your privacy or mine and even if you do choose to turn off the unnecessary cookies and the personalization which is another way of saying behavior tracking if you turn it all off if you say no i do not consent even if you can still use the website, more often than not, the website has already, even before you see it, has indicated to Facebook and to data brokers that you're visiting that website. So whether you say yes or no doesn't matter because you've already been identified and tracked. And the information about you amalgamated with information about you that other organizations that you don't have a direct connection with, no relationship, you don't even know what companies they are or where in the world they are. They know more about you than you know about yourself. Hey, That's listen, called this, consent these days. Listen to this. There's a guy called Patrick watching us right now, and he says he got onto the show through my LinkedIn account. I didn't even know what he's talking about. First of all, I have a LinkedIn account just so I could correct the name and the falsities about me. Uh, I, I, I don't communicate with everybody. I deny about 100 people a week who want to connect to me. How Pat, I'm going to ask this guy, Patrick, when I get a hold of him, how did he get in through my LinkedIn account? I want to know, and then I'm going to stop that. Let's get to our next question. The watch party in Newton, Massachusetts. You mentioned labeling all AI. What happened to that? Okay, that's a good one. Some episodes ago, I don't know which one it was, I said, we immediately, now, today, before midnight, need to start labeling every piece of AI generated material with a big label that says uh, a generated or processed by AI or AI processed in the same way that we now say made in Japan, made in the United States, and in the same way that every newsreel 
and every news show has a has a label saying live or previously filmed. What do you say, uh, Sharon? Well, it's, I'll say the same thing as I said to a Canadian parliamentary committee. It has to be consistent internationally because if only one country has this sort of requirement, what you don't want done here will be done elsewhere. And the internet disregards borders. So the opportunists among us will use it to their advantage wherever they have to log on. Absolutely. And remember, what is made illegal from uh, Massachusetts to California can be done legally in international waters on a giant boat. So there's no way to legislate about, there's no way to legislate this away. The threat is here, too late to stop it. And um, uh, even though I said blow up the servers, Wes was out there saying, oh, you can't blow up enough servers. Whatever the reason, it's too late now. Now let's get here to uh, the watch party in Chicago. How will the politicians exploit AI? Will it be fraud or convincing arguments or all of the above? It's all of the above. Uh, they're going to lie better. They're going to defraud better. They're going to convince better. And uh, we have to remember that, Ob that Obama won his second election uh, and gave thanks to a mysterious crew of behavioral scientists working in the basement who could determine the difference between a um, between a red a red lobster uh, customer and a shopper at Whole Foods, and that they had a deep dive into um, into behavioral psychology, and now with AI being able to uh, uh, extrapolate with only three seconds, I think you're going to try to find the best message put forth with the best environment, with the best uh, looking face. A couple of days ago, um, uh, one of my producers, Eve, said, look at this bad movie called Looker from 1981. It was a C-rated science fiction film. And back in 1981, they were talking about kidnapping um, models and pretty faces to make AI images down to the millimeter, which would have, which would uh, be measured with the most pupil excitation and captivate people's attention just for um, commercial purposes. Thanks for the movie, Eve. Let's get to Sally in Memphis. What about fake kidnappings? Even mothers who know their daughters well have been fooled. Take it away, Sharon. Oh, yes, deep fakes. And that is a big, big problem. It's not just the, the grandparents scheme, the scam where someone calls and you know, crinkles some cellophane so that there's static on the line. Grandma, I was arrested. I need no, don't call my parents. They'll be mortified. I'll never be able to face them. I mean, just send money. It's more than that because now with only a few seconds and with our voices being captured wherever we go online. And don't forget during COVID, everybody had to stay home and go to work virtually with their images and their voices captured in somebody's database that is not secure because at some point, every database will be breached because they're created by fallible people and the databases and the security is fallible and they're already creating deep fakes of not just voices, but images that are really, really difficult to distinguish from the real ones. So people are going to have to learn to have a serious dose of skepticism and be distrusting of the very technologies that we've been told for so long will help us, will provide convenience that will benefit us. You know, I, I had a call, a mysterious call, uh, a couple of months ago from a voice that said, hi, grandpa, this is me. Uh, I might need some help. And I just listened along and uh, pretended uh, I was going along with it just to hear what the scam would be. And then they, uh, they finally begged off. Now I have two messages for two of our viewers. Eve, uh, you tell me that Furbies were banned from the CIA and military in 1999. Please help me a helpless person. Tell me what the hell a Furby was. Would you put it into the uh, text so I know where to f 
That's F-U-R-B-Y. Tell me where the Furby was. And I also want to tell this guy who is uh, attending um, without a name on your machine. Uh, you have a, a, a green identification uh, and no initial. So last session, we uh, had to remove you because you cannot attend without your name. So I'm going to leave you on uh, for this time. But if I see you again without a name, I'm unfortunately going to have to remove you. If it's just an accident or if it's an oversight, uh, get in there now and put your first and last name into your Zoom machine. Let's get to our next question. Uh, Morris in London, can AI start a war? You bet AI can start a war. Um, we almost had AI start a war. I mean, you could have an AI claiming that uh, Putin uh, has just launched um, missiles and he's urging everyone to uh, to evacuate and it's and it's fake. You could have uh, a fake Pearl Harbor. You could have a fake presidential statement. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. And remember, it can go all around the internet within minutes. I'm I'm reminded of when we first did one of our first AI reports that there was a military man who said the AI turned on the operator and murdered the operator when the operator interrupted. And that got everybody crazy. Then he said, just kidding. Well, the point is great, you're just kidding. But that's part of it. What do you say, Sharon? One of the important protections we have is that people in uh, of a certain age were taught how to be self-reliant and they have critical thinking skills whether from upbringing, from whatever they had to deal with in their own lives, skeptical, common sense, clear thinking, and they would, they're would they very capable of analyzing the situation and not being easily swayed. Critical thinking is not taught very often anymore. So children, young adults, not so young adults, a lot of them go with the flow, which is also a matter of human nature. Because it's easier and you're less likely to uh, be bullied or be criticized or be chided. Who do you think you are? You don't want to go with the rest of the crowd. No, you go with the flow, go along to get along and just don't argue. Do what you're told. Be obedient. We're, that's how we're raised is be obedient. Respect your elders. That need the the critical thought needs to be reintroduced into the curriculum starting at the very earliest ages, so that people and that is the future teachers, politicians, physicians, lawmakers, bureaucrats, everybody. They need to be taught once again how to think for themselves and question authority. Because without questioning authority, and I'm not saying challenge it and ref, and and refuse to obey, but think. Think whether it is good, and I'm not talking about good from your perspective or mine. Is it a worthwhile, moral, ethical thing that is being proposed? Because otherwise, without critical thought, Edwin, I, I think I might have shown you this before. I have this little folder on my desk from 1939 with a hammer and sickle. And on the inside, it is somebody's identity card from Russia where you do as you are told or else. And too many countries nowadays, liberal democracies included, are going that way because people have been silenced by the fear of retribution into merely obeying. We cannot just accept that, assume that artificial intelligence will take over our lives. We have to have our own independent thought and make our own choices whether we want that into our lives or not. You know, you are reminding me with that one flicker of hope that maybe man can make a choice at the fork of the road. You're reminding me that I wrote in my uh, IBM and the Holocaust about Holland, where the thought and other countries where the thought was, if it can be done, it should be done. And these technocrats just said, OK, well, identify the Jews and we'll pick them up and send them to camps 
uh, for their extermination and we'll do it because it's a magnificent computer exercise. In that case, a punch card exercise. I wrote an important chapter on that. Let's go to yes. the, the live questions. First of all, Wes in San Francisco uh, now gives us a This Just In report. Uh, he says that Cigna Health just announced they're using AI to deny claims, medical claims. Here, Eve is complaining about face wreck. You're complaining about the Michigan Midas. And now we've got AI uh, doing this. Sharon, what's your thought here? The Cigna is not the first to do that. It's as simple as that. This has been going on for a very, very long time. And th there's all sorts of artificial intelligence tools being used by companies. Uh, th there's some that behind the so-called confidential internal communications platforms that everyone in an organization must use is artificial intelligence that's coded to find if there's certain words. If a person says looking for a new job or if they say something that has been coded as a red flag word, whether it's racist, biased, unkind, uh, it says a name, a political reference, anything, all of this is already in use in all sorts of organizations, including medical and insurance. I mean, we've got all sorts of sensors and, and the advertising put in this sensor in your car so you can improve your driving and maybe get a, a lower insurance rate. Put in these sensors in your home so that you can be told by the artificial intelligence in the sensor if there's too much humidity, if there's a water leak. It also tells the insurance company at the same time, and that gives the insurance company the ammunition they need to deny your claim for a water leak because you didn't do as the AI said quickly enough. Our insurance um, is behind an just, awful lot of this. That's just so frightening. And when you mentioned that, I remember that my wife went in for the state farm thing where they put this uh, little sensor in, in your windshield. And then one day I got a, a fine from state farm for my driving, reckless driving. And when it said, what is it? They said, you braked and you accelerated. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And I realized I would have to uh, engage AI gladiators just to find out what this meant. Very well said. I also want to do you, want, do you want to know how that system works, though? Yeah. At least in, in Canadian jurisdictions, the insurance company is only allowed to monitor four things of the car. Fast start, hard, uh, fast start hard stop, time of day, and turns, if you take a turn very quickly. Time of day actually makes a difference because it's higher risk if you're driving at dusk or dawn, and depending whether you're in the north or the south part of a country, dusk and dawn are different times of day, of course, so that's part of the risk rating. That's all they're allowed to monitor, but in order for you to perhaps earn that discount in your driving insurance rates, you must have the AI app on your phone and have it on at all times. The apps are not Canadian, they're American, and they don't track what your car is doing, they track the very, very sensitive metering in your phone. And that's how they find out if your phone is being used, if a text is being sent while a car is in motion, what car? it is 99% accurate, according to one of the manufacturers of one of these technologies, uh, to the point that it, they know if the, ve the phone entered the vehicle from this door or that, where it went into the, inside the vehicle in the passenger compartment, if it was on the dash, if it was on your lap, if it fell on the floor. They know that, and it's because of the app, yes. the AI. And, and remember, these phones, they have a little eye in there, and it's called Grimace Control, and they're trying to figure out what your attitude is. Now, I have a couple of comments here from our listeners. This guy, Patrick Neal, I'm going to get a hold, a hold of him, and uh, about my LinkedIn. He says that the AI killed the operator deal is actually a, mis a misquote and it was um, 
uh, it was a misquote, and uh, it, um, uh, he got that from the Guardian. We also checked. It isn't that it was a misquote. He misspoke. And first he said he misspoke as a joke, and then he said, well, it was a serious joke, so I just mis so I just misspoke. So I am aware of that. Let's see what else we have. Uh, um, there's too much here. Patrick Neal, please go into the chat and tell me how the heck you got into this Zoom session through my LinkedIn account. And who are you? I understand you're somebody that Sharon knows. Sharon, who is this guy, Patrick Neal? He is somebody you want to know, Dr. Patrick Neal. Um, well, my knee he, hurts. Is he that kind of a doctor? Oh, no, 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 no. If you want to know how artificial intelligence and police agencies and law enforcement operate, that's his area of expertise. Okay, let's go to our next open question. Patrick Neal, thank you for your contribution to the topic. Evolution, is it now possible that we have entered the transhumanism? Maybe we have to. All, we, we have already crossed that threshold. So he talks about transhumanism. Now this is something. Let's see uh, that I spoke about in my uh, book um, on eugenics, war against the weak, as the next step. There is a transhumanist, a transhumanism organization led by some of the leading thinkers of our day, and they believe that we should self-direct and self-capture our own evolutionary path. And they would like to merge man with machine, machine with animal, uh, super soldiers, super thinkers, designer babies, and all of that. That's an important topic you bring up, uh, uh, Patrick. And I'm asking Eve uh, to put this on our list of topics. Next time we uh, have an open episode, we will talk about transhumanism and invite all the experts back. Um, he also wishes, he has another question here. If we know it's coming, can we embrace change? The evolutionary nature of information is uh, is genome based, he says more or less. How do we propose how do you propose we navigate? No, the idea is not to jump in the river and flow over the falls. The idea is to jump out of the river and walk past the falls so we survive the falls. You're talking to a guy who's been down the Colorado River uh, at least a half a dozen times. And so um, I believe it is better to do what Sharon said, which is make the choice while we still can. Just as I told Sharon, please take the camera while you still can. Eve wants to know in Jersey, what do we do with an actually sentient AI when it arrives? I think it should be made its own owner, but I don't expect that. Now, look, here's an intelligent person, and she is asking, should not a sentient AI, meaning a self-aware AI, be its own owner? So by that very uh, question, she's jumping the gap between uh, uh, human rights and uh, AI rights. Sharon, what are you saying about this? Oh, it's not inevitable. If we accept that it is, then it will be. If we accept that the companies, the self-interested companies, their shareholders, their stakeholders, and we're not them unless we own shares in the companies, if we accept that they are working on our behalf, then we will embrace it. If we believe that the marketing that they put out to improve their bottom line and their shareholders standing is in our best interest, we will embrace it. If we question it, if we do our own research, if we don't spend hours doom scrolling for trivialities and we actually do research on legitimate, credible websites from legitimate, credible sources and make our own choices. It's like I told my kids when they were little, you have a brain, use it. Make a choice or someone will make it for you. And as I tell others, the, the human mind is like a parachute. It won't work unless it's open. Let's go to our next question. This is, the last one was Morrison, London. This is Maria in Mexico City. Hi, I'll be there next spring. 
uh, hold my tequila. Uh, it says, will AI impact all countries or just the industrialized ones? I've got a, a theory here, and I might ask, uh, uh, I might ask Sharon what she thinks. I believe that AI, even though it looks like it'll it'll fester throughout the the American elite and the infrastructure and the internet based communities, may very well experiment on and try to infest an underdeveloped society. Uh, or a third world society, or one which is an emerging society to see what it could do in the same way that our great pharmaceutical companies uh, do all their massive tests when they want on little villages and no one knows what the hell is going on. What do you say, Sharon? I think it's already happened. We've seen China loan trillions of dollars to developing nations. They own those nations now. And it's very easy once you own someone that you can control what they do. Yes, uh, in fact, um, uh, it's part of our next China threat episode that uh, China, which is masquerading as a developing nation, gets money from the World Bank. It loans this money out of predatory rates to countries that can never re repay it. Then it gets repaid through the International Monetary Fund and seizes the assets in a vulture sense of the ports, the bridges, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Maria, for your question. Peter and Marcia in Los Angeles, what about the good AI can bring? Well, we dealt with that, Peter and Marcia, and thank you very much for your constant questions. And Sharon has given many examples, and I can give a dozen more, and anyone else can give a dozen more. There's lots of good that can, can come out of the internet. Lots of good that can come out of computers, but they have to be controlled. We need to control the computer, not the computer trolling us. We need to control the flame, not the flame controlling us. Sharon. You're absolutely right. We are the ones that have to make the choice so that it's not made for us. And it's a matter of perspective. Is it good? From whose perspective? Is being able to spy on my spouse because I don't trust them a good thing? Is is the same spy where a good thing in the hands of a law enforcement agency in this country or that country or another country? It's the same tool. And it's a matter of perspective and how the people use that tool. It's like my car, how I use it every day. It's a matter of perspective. Either I can use it like a, a responsible driver, or I can use it as a lethal weapon. It's a matter of perspective, how we use these tools and how we allow them. Do we make the choice of having a doorbell camera because everybody's doing it and we're told it'll, we, can, we don't have to get up from the sofa to see who's at the door? For some people, that's a burden. For most people, I think it's not such a burden to get up Take a few steps and see who's at the door. You're not compelled to answer it. But even if you see somebody was at the door in the middle of the day while you're away, what's that going to do for you? And right, cameras I'm, don't stop crime. They I'm, might, might give evidence. I've, I have about 15 questions pending. I'm going to take four <laughs> so we finish this rapidly because I'm over time. And uh, my editors are going to complain. Scott and Roanoke, Virginia, we're going to go very fast here. This reminds me of the film Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And I just want to say that's a fabulous film. And I really recommend that everybody watch all four versions of that film. It's remade every couple of years. And it's about the alien life form, the alien threat, whatever that threat is. Was it communism? Was it out of space? Was it uh, lack of control? Um, and it little by little takes over all the personalities in the village. Uh, uh, real fast, Sharon, do you know this movie, Invasion of the Body Snatchers? No, but there's been so many. Uh, Minority Report is a, a, a classic to me. There's so many that were, they were predicting, I think, what could happen. They were not, like 1984, though, they were not supposed to be the roadmap of how to accomplish it. Right. Now, uh, we're going to Corey in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, sorry, Joan, this is Corey. Will criminals create their own 
dedicated AI facilitators. I have a one word reply. Yes. Share. Already done. All, they've already, already done it. Already yes. done. Yeah. And they've got their own version of chat GPT so that they can craft the most credible scam emails. It used to be that if you saw grammatical or punctuation errors, bad grammar, those were the, the telltale sim signals that it might not be a legitimate email. With their own version of ChatGPT, though, the the language, the grammar, the punctuation is impeccable. All right, let's go and to when it's Devin. impeccable, it's let, harder to spot. Let, let's go to Devin in Philadelphia. How does AI work in the military? I can tell you that because Israel has an AI system that it's getting prepared uh, to unleash uh, in Lebanon and against Lebanon and Iran uh, and Gaza has already done once. Basically the AI system detects the threat and figures out what is the best method of neutralizing the threat. Is it an artillery shell? Is it an air to ground missile? Is it a... Uh, uh, a tank blast? Is it a small core of men going in? <clears throat> and it sends out those instructions. <clears throat> and uh, I believe we uh, we did see it in, uh, deployed when Israel took out the leading aspects of Palestinian Islamic Jihad some months ago. And I fear we're going to see it be unleashed again in the north be, uh, of Israel because Hezbollah, which is of course the front uh, arm of uh, Iran, has planted a couple of tents uh, across the border. And I think those tents have uh, um, underground tunnels in them. And from there, they expect to pour across the border. Melody in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, I hear your audience is constantly asking if there is hope. Is there hope? And I'll say, I'll let um, Sharon answer first. She's a good natured person. Sharon, is there hope? If each of us takes this seriously and takes it in hand and stands up and does something about it, yes. If we obediently roll over and accept it as an inevitability, no. All right, based on, I will answer now, based on everything I know, and based on the um, uh, possibilities that Sharon just mentioned, my answer is, is there hope? No, I always answer no. Okay, that's it. We are out of time, I'm telling you. This was great, it was fun. Uh, I'm gonna go for my whiskey. Uh, I want you to hold every, everyone for my closing word of wisdom just one minute away. But first I wanna thank my esteemed and knowledgeable guest, Sharon Polsky. I also thank my talented international team, including Richard in the Philippines, John in Japan. I think you're going to edit this one. Barb in Tennessee and Eve in New Jersey for their outstanding work, as well as many others in numerous additional cities around the world. My team, each of them, is comprised of very dedicated people. I and we all owe them. I'll see everyone back here next week at 3 p.m. Eastern. You want to be a friend of the Edwin Black Show? Go to the edwinblackshow.com slash support. Keep me independent. You want to hear me in person? Good. Watch my website for events. Uh, I was in Israel a couple weeks ago. I was in Washington this week. Uh, I'll be with the folks in uh, uh, Cincinnati next month. Consult my events page at edwinblack.com. Until then, head over to any Barnes & Noble in the USA or any Amazon, Walmart, Apple, or Kobo platform in 190 countries across this roiling, toiling, boiling planet where you can find any of my 200 book editions such as IBM and the Holocaust, soon to be a major Hollywood blockbuster as soon as God wraps up these two uh, writers and actor strikes. You want an autographed copy? Hit my personal newly redesigned website, edwinblack.com, and click Books. Thank you, Wes. Get access alerts to participate live in future shows at the edwinblackshow.com. You'll see a much enhanced and exquisitely produced version of this very show and prior episodes, hundreds of them, by subscribing to our YouTube channel at the Edwin Black Show. Click the notification button like tens of thousands of others have. You will love them. We put new ones up each week produced by my bold international crew. You can follow me at Edwin Black Book on Twitter and Facebook. 
And now for my closing word of wisdom, you can be good and study history. You can be good and learn from history. Or you can be great and actually make history. Thank you, world. I'm zooming out. Bless all of you.